Good afternoon uh, to all. I'm Dr. Padma Gunratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, let me warmly welcome all of you to the uh, webinar that was organized by the SLMA Expert Committee in Medical Rehabilitation. This is a regular webinar that we use to organize. The, uh, except, I mean, we just skipped last month as there was 134th anniversary International Medical Congress organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association last month. So it was after a while that we are going to have this webinar in this month today. And uh, we have a very eminent speaker. She's Dr. Jayatri Jagod, who needs no introduction to the rheumatology and rehabilitation community here in Sri Lanka. Dr. Jayatri Jagoda is the consultant in rheumatology and rehabilitation, Lady Ridgeway Hospital for Children in Colombo. She's an active member of the uh, SLMA Expert Committee in Medical Rehabilitation. She would be talking to us on cerebral palsy at a glance. Jayatri had been involved with the rehabilitation of patients with cerebral palsy for a very long period at the uh, uh, Lady Ridgeway Hospital. So she would be making use of her expertise in making the presentation today on cerebral palsy at a glance. So let me welcome Dr. Jayatri Jagoda and to invite her to make her presentation. Jayatri, over to you. Thank you very much, Madam, for your kind uh, uh, introduction. Uh, let me share the slides with you. Uh, today, uh, my talk is on cerebral palsy at a glance. At the outset, I would like to uh, thank the organizers, uh, organizers and Madam and SLMA for giving me this chance, the opportunity to talk to you about cerebral palsy. Uh, which is uh, kind of has become my pet subject by now. Um, I'm, of course, a, an adult rheumatologist converted into a pediatric one now since I started working in uh, Lady Ridgeway Hospital. Uh, even before that, uh, I was inspired by Dr. Nihal Gunatilaka, my mentor and the teacher in cerebral palsy. So let me share. Uh, what I understand and uh, some of my experience um, in cerebral palsy. I named it at a glance because uh, cerebral palsy is a vast subject. Uh, and uh, in an, uh, one hour 45 minute lecture, we can't go into depths of it. I'm just going to touch upon uh, a brief introduction and uh, talking uh, uh, kind of superficially about it and trying to touch the diagnosis, the management, and uh, many uh, things that are evolving in the world on uh, early detection and management of cerebral palsy. So if you ask the question, what is cerebral palsy? It is the most common motor disability of childhood. It's a group of conditions with the variable severity. The variable, uh, the severity would be very variable. There'll be a child uh, who uh, cannot, you know, swallow his own saliva, tube fed, peg, uh, needed peg tube to feed, uh, and uh, just barely recognize what is happening in the surrounding uh, environment. And also there's on the other end of the spectrum, there'll be a child, running around, going to school normally and with normal intelligence, uh, academically performing very well in school. So it's a very variable thing. So, um, but they all have, uh, have some common developmental features. Uh, cerebral palsy is due to an insult uh, to the developing brain. It has to be differentiated from the common childhood disabilities in the sense um, uh, myopathies and congenital abnormalities, uh, they are different from cerebral palsy. This is due to a normally growing brain, uh, you know, uh, subject to, subjected to a problem, uh, a transient problem 
during the development. It could be prenatal, it could be postnatal, or perinatal. Uh, uh, it could be perinatal around the time of the birth. So it has been found that prevalence is around 1.5 to 2.5 live births. In the world, we don't have our prevalence data um, in Sri Lanka. So uh, if I talk about definition, uh, when I was a senior registrar in LRH many years ago in 2004, or uh, late 2004, uh, you know, my mentor he used to tell that uh, the, that the then definition was to tell that cerebral palsy is a, a problem of movement and posture. But he used to tell us there's many more to it. There is epilepsy, uh, uh, vision, and a lot of th more other things, uh, behavior, communication, cognition. So many things are affected. So the definition we then had is not, he was always telling us it's not a complete definition. Then later on came the proper definition of um, cerebral palsy, the current one by Dr. Ros Rosenbaum et al. So it is, goes as cerebral palsy describes a group of permanent disorders of the development of movement and posture causing activity limitation that is attributed to non-progressive disturbance that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain the motor disorder of cerebral palsy are often accompanied by disturbances of sensation, perception, cognition, communication, and behavior, and by epilepsy and by secondary musculoskeletal problems. Um, so if you talk about the risk factors, preterm birth is the biggest risk factor. They are 50 times more at risk before 28 weeks of gestation. But if you take the majority of Cerebral palsy cases are not uh, preterm. That's because the number of preterm infants are uh, much less than the term kids. So out of all the cerebral palsies, the percentage that uh, percentage of kids that have cerebral palsy is less, but the biggest risk factor is preterm birth. So birth asphyxia, causing brain hypoxia can cause it, infections, chorium neonitis, congenital infections, infections around birth, neonatal convulsions, seizure disorders, placental abnormalities, fetal growth retardation or IGR, neonatal hypobilirubinemia, neonatal sepsis, and there are, uh, the list is not complete. So there are a lot of risk factors. In the pathophysiology, there's much heterogeneity observed. A proper understanding to explain the spectrum of vari variations and enabling specific strategic interventions of management and pre uh, prevention is yet to come. So uh, people are trying to understand, but still uh, to relate everything and how to manage specifically the specific problems uh, is yet to come. It's a brain injury rather than developmental abnormality. So normally growing brain subjected to some form of injury and then that injury is not going to uh, persist. The damage is not going to uh, uh, go on. It, it stops there, but the problems stay. So the stage of maturity of the brain at the time of an insult determines the type and site of the brain lesion. So um, if you... Uh, uh, Think of, I'll come to that later. Brain develops in three stages. So each stage, well, whether it happens in the pre uh, fetal life or perinatal or postnatal, determines the site and uh, nature of the problem that is occurring in the brain. So the diagnosis for that for diagnosis we use it's mainly clinical, and there are uh, these uh, new. Uh, relatively new thing coming in, general movements assessment, ultrasound brain, MRI brain, and uh, different assessment tools are there to help. Uh, you have to suspect and uh, the at-risk children, they have to undergo these tests. And uh, when you use these uh, tools for diagnosis, mainly clinical, uh, they have a high degree of specificity and sensitivity. I'll come to that later again. So then uh, again, uh, 
certain amount of uh, cerebral children with cerebral palsy have even normal MRI. 11 to 17 percent have normal MRI. Should be investigated for another course. Always you have to exclude the other causes, especially the treatable causes, metabolic causes, and so on, to tell that um, this is cerebral palsy. So if the MRI is normal, you have to look for another course. So children with no known risk factors who also show clinical feature, features should also be screened. So the motor types, I'll, I'll come back to diagnosis later. So there are uh, so many uh, you know, classifications and different types. So there are uh, motor types, uh, spastic, dyskinetic, ataxic and mixed types, uh, various types. So spastic is the most commonest type. So what happens is um, uh, this is the most common form. Uh, they arise from the motor cortex, uh, in the parasitical gyrus. So it's a problem in the cortex. Uh, depending on the uh, degree of uh, affected cortex, it is, uh, you know, it can be classified as diplegia, hemiplegia, um, uh, monoplegia, and so on. So, and uh, this kind of take uh, cerebral palsy is characterized by involuntary movements arising from basal ganglia damage, dystonia, and dyskinesia, and ataxia is basically when the cerebellum is damaged. So, and uh, what we now, uh, we see mostly the spastic and the mixed types of cerebral palsy. Those are the commonly seen ones. So this is again to show you how the uh, cortex is affected uh, and the areas of the cortex, and it relates to the uh, patterns of cerebral palsy. This hemiplegia, when a small area of uh, one large area of one side of the parasitical cortex is affected, where diplegia, Mm, relatively smaller area, but both sides are affected. So your legs get affected more than the lower limbs get affected more than the upper limbs, but diplegia can be really severe. Then uh, quadriplegia, athetoid and dystonic and ataxic types. And uh, there are basal ganglia uh, affected causing athetoid and dystonic types and the cerebellum causing ataxic, ataxic uh, cerebral palsy. So brain lesions in cerebral palsy also can be related to the site and type uh, times. So, uh, and this first uh, MRI shows uh, in a scan at 32 weeks of gestation showing frontal lobe hypoplasia and polymicroglia. Polymicrogyra uh, that is causing cerebral palsy, and uh, that this child has developed severe bilateral spastic cerebral palsy. And um, when the uh, brain affects a bit later, later on, like peri, uh, perinatal insult, so it's usually affecting the. Uh, periventricular areas. The second MRI shows, uh, the MRI B shows uh, periventricular leukomalacia. This child also de de has developed bilateral spastic cerebral palsy with GMFCS level four. Um, and the third one, uh, it's, uh, this MRI has been taken three years of age uh, with uh, birth asphyxia uh, term, it shows cortical and subcortical atrophy, particularly marked in the periolanic region and uh, for foreign catholic cysts have been formed. So these are the MRI changes that can be observed in the children with cerebral palsy, but uh, still the investigators are looking at how to evaluate that to relate to function. So I'll skip through this slide quickly because uh, we have talked of this. So depending on the site, I told you how uh, uh, spasticity, dyskinesia, and ataxia occurs. And then in addition, there'll be swallowing problems, cognitive problems, hearing and vision, language, 
Secondary musculoskeletal problems occurs with time and seizures. Uh, so how do how does it happen? And uh, uh, if you can see uh, there, this is a slide that I have inherited from Dr. Mihalbanathilaka. It explains how uh, the motor problems in cerebral palsy happens. Uh, uh, it's an upper motor neuron syndrome where the cortex is affected, cerebral cortex. Uh, then it causes an upper motor neuron syndrome, which is resulting in a deficiency of cortical input, leading to three types of problems, positive features, negative features, and adaptive features. So what are the positive features? So these positive features, a lot of people recognize, and the lot of, uh, we are trying to address positive features uh, mostly. So that is spasticity, hyperexcitable stretch reflex, pathological reflexes, and abnormal resistance to passive, in, passive movement. So why does this happen? If I go back to the uh, previous slide, so it's due to deficiency of cortical input. So how, how does the deficiency of cortical inputs lead to this? Is It uh, fails to inhibit the reflex arc fails to uh, inhibit the hypertonia. So if you remember your, uh, you know, neuro, neurology, neuroanatomy, uh, we uh, learned early days, the reflex arcs and the spasticity uh, forming basic thing is reflex arc that is inhibited by the cortical input, uh, inputs. So that is not there in these children. And it also causes negative features that is muscle weakness. So there are a lot of cortical connections happening uh, and muscle weakness, loss of coordination and slowness of muscle activation. For us to function very smoothly and de dexterously, so there are a lot of cortical connections controlling our movement. So in these children where the cortex is affected, um, not a, uh, a cerebral cortex, cortex has a lot of connections in us. So that leads to coordination. So when even we, uh, you know, maintain our posture, some muscles have to uh, co-contract. If, uh, if we want to move a limb, some muscles have to, you know, uh, uh, reciprocally inhibit. So the, those things happen through cortical connections, lot of connections, so which is lacking in these children. So it causes weakness of muscles and loss of coordination and slowness of muscle activation. So you can see, especially the dystonic children, when they try to, if you have seen a child with cerebral palsy, when they try, then he tries to touch something, his mouth is also deviating, trunk is also deviating. So uh, there's loss of uh, lack of coordination. So, and selective motor control is very difficult. So these uh, positive features and negative features lead to adaptive features. Uh, over a time period when these problems are not so solved, there are changes in the properties of muscles and soft tissues. So, uh, and uh, the motor patterns would be altered. So, learning the pathophysiology of movement disorders in cerebral palsy. So, lack of cortical control results in hyperreflexia, hypertonus, and reduction in the number of motor units recruited, leading to weakness. So, if you see, uh, look at the muscle in the periphery, uh, motor units, uh, number of motor units recruited uh, is uh, less. And that causes ineffective manipulative skills. Uh, and there's lack of synchronization of synergistic muscles. So uh, for us to, for instance, we have to sit upright, uh, your paravertebral muscles, uh, your abdominal muscles and everything has to contract synergistically. And if you, you to hold the neck up, you have head control, all the neck muscles have to uh, work synergistically. So lack of synchronization of synergistic muscles and impaired interaction between agonist and antagonist. It is, uh, again, reciprocal inhibition is not there and 
core contraction is not there. So, uh, so this is these are the problems that leading to the uh, movement disorder in cerebral palsy. And what it it, it leads to impaired posture control. So now, uh, so which leads to this complicated picture. Uh, if you look at this uh, first girl who is there, uh, you can see her hands are posturing. That is, uh, this child is having dystonia. Uh, her mouth is open. There's a bib around her neck uh, to show that she's drooling and her mouth is open. Uh, if you can appreciate that her special seat has a, a neck a headrest, so that means uh, she lacks head control. So this, the picture looks like that she's a GMFCS level five, which I will come to that later. Uh, the child is having severe cerebral palsy. Again, uh, the pathophysiology we were talking about can lead to this picture if not uh, uh, it's very severe, uh, severe disability. And here's the second child. So she's having an NG tube. That means that the child is having a swallowing difficulty. And we have used so many pillows to uh, keep him in a good posture show that it, uh, he's having, again, having dystonia, this type of children. They need a lot of support uh, to sit upright. She has no trunk balance uh, and even swallowing difficulty. And the third child also, he has a good amount of head control so he can uh, sit without the head support. So this is the picture that they end up uh, having all the problems that we discussed earlier. Uh, so there are uh, functional classifications. Uh, so I have, I'm not going to talk about, there are so many functional classifications. I'm not going into details of everything. So these are the few major ones. GMFCS is the language in cerebral palsy. Everybody talks about the cerebral palsy in the language of GMFCS which I'll come to details, functional mobility scale, manual ability uh, scale, and CFCS is used by the speech and language therapy. So many different classifications, and there's an endless list. So if we take time to understand what GMFCS level is, because that's the basic, uh, you need that basic understanding. So there are five levels of GMFCS. Uh, the first three are ambulators and the last two are non-ambulators. So uh, GMFC is level one child. I told you that cerebral palsy has a very variable picture at the beginning. So there are children who can, you know, run, jump, do everything, but still have a cerebral palsy. So level one child can uh, run around in any terrain and climb upstairs without using their hands for support. So that's a level one child, but they may be slow, uh, maybe a little uh, slower than their peers, but they can have uh, a, a, they, they can, uh, do everything that their peers do. So when it comes to level two, they also can walk without any support, but uh, they need uh, uneven terrain and the stairs, they need support. The, so he's having the support of the railing to climb up the stairs. So GMFC is level three, that child now needs a handheld devices for ambulating long distances. Uh, uh, ambulating relatively short distances, but in the community, he will use a wheelchair for long distances. So still can ambulate with, with a handheld device. GMFC is level four. He's virtually uh, needs a, a wheelchair, but can cover small distances with a posterior walk, with a lot of balance. It's not, the, uh, not like the level three one who just needs a crutch. Uh, 
GMFC is level five children. Uh, they don't even have the head control. That's the most severe type of cerebral palsy. So they have to be transported in a wheelchair. They are not able to you know, self-propel or even handle a motorized wheelchair. They usually need to be uh, transported in the wheelchair and their head has to be also supported. Mm. So I would like to draw your attention to uh, GMFCS level extended and revised. So the, the GMFCS chart that we uh, looked earlier, now this, this chart is for uh, children above six and below 12, six to 12 years old, we use this chart. So this levels of around um, uh, GMFCS levels, it tends to level off around the age of six. So there are, you can divide them into uh, these four five types but before that also you can classify them as a gmfcs level where it is not that easy you need a reference so um, by using this you can you know classify the children into the gmfcs level even earlier uh, so this is in a website called can child so uh, it's a very useful thing so i would like to draw your attention um, this is uh, before second birth. It, it has different age groups before second birth, day two to four and four to six like that. So if you want to, uh, you know, if you draw your, uh, if I draw your attention to level, uh, sorry, level two infants, these infants, Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, so GMFC is level two before second birthday means that infants maintain floor sitting, but may need to use their hands for support to maintain balance. So infants creep on their stomach or crawl on their hands and knees. Infants may pull to stand and take steps holding onto furniture. Why I wanted to draw your attention here is if you want to, you know, develop these children uh, for to be ambulators at least level two, before the second birthday, you need to achieve at least floor sitting and pull to stand and take a few uh, steps, at least holding on to furniture. If a child has achieved this by, uh, you know, the second birthday, they, uh, they can be ambulators later. So uh, level one infants, move in and out of sitting, close it with both hands free to manipulate objects. We call it dynamic balance, level one infants. Uh, so they can, uh, to be level one, you should be, a child should be able to close it and move from uh, in and out of sitting, can crawl on hands and knees, pull to stand and take a few steps holding onto furniture. Maybe they will walk between 18 months and two years. So this level one and level two, uh, we need to achieve this during our early interventions. We really need to concentrate on the early uh, uh, years of cerebral palsy to get to this level if you want to walk these children. So it's very important to follow that. This extended, expanded and revised uh, GMFCS level to understand and plan management. So this is the, just a brief introduction about manual ability, manual ability classification. This is used by occupational therapists to uh, have a gauge around about hand functions. So there are five levels again. Level one is handles object easily and successfully. And level five is that does not handle objects and has severely limited ability to perform even simple actions. And in between there is a grading. And this is uh, communication functional classification, CFCS, uh, used by uh, speech therapists. I'm just giving you a little introduction about the different classification tools used by different therapists. So uh, this level one is, again, there are five levels, effective sender and receiver. Yeah, the child could... Uh, uh, 
talk and the receiver listener can uh, even an unfamiliar listener can uh, understand what he is telling so uh, level 5 seldom effective sender and uh, even with the familiar uh, uh, receiver cannot understand what the child is expressing so there are so many other assessments um, to name a few so there are a few important ones that Alberta Infant Motor Scale aims, which I'm using uh, in my clinic as well. It is good to assess the children um, below uh, uh, one and a half years life. Uh, after that, it is not effective. So it's a very good uh, tool to assess where the child is and can monitor the development. And Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination online, it's a very important um, uh, tool uh, in cerebral palsy. I'll tell you, I, I have mentioned it uh, even earlier, I'll come to that later. And gait analysis, hope, um, uh, so many things that you can use to assess these children. So, when it comes to the management, it's a very challenging thing. So um, it's uh, if you, it's a challenge. It is a challenge, I must tell you, um, because there are so many problems involved. So it's a complex problem. There are parents who are anxious. They are in denial. They have unrealistic expectations. They have no time, they have to go to work, um, leaving these uh, poor uh, disabled children behind, and then they even don't cope, poor coping. So there are so many things that we need to uh, address from the uh, parents' point of view. Doctors and therapists, a uh, lot of us, they, we don't understand cerebral palsy properly, and sometimes some people lack like empathy, we, we don't have time, uh, time is a big problem. You have in a heavy clinic, you don't even have time to assess. So just you know, crowd clearing and the skills. And uh, biggest thing is understanding. And secondarily, leads to the lack of skills. So in society, there's discrimination, lack of support, uh, refusal from school. All that is there. If I tell uh, you the stories, uh, you know. There are endless stories to show examples. So we need to approach this uh, problem holistically. The child's medical condition, the caregiver status, uh, sometimes the medical condition, which I uh, talked to you a few, these children who have uh, swallowing problems, they are always in and out of hospital. You know, they can't swallow, they, they get recurrent infections, respiratory infections, and um, so, there's a mother is frustrated, there is care, but the mother has to go to work and then somebody who doesn't know much about the child is staying there, family dynamics, the father doesn't cope, the father leaves, economy, everything should be taken into consideration. Multiple inputs needed, nutritional, mobility, manual ability, speech language, behavior, education, social issues, meant, uh, parents, mental condition, everything has to be address so from the parents point of view uh, there could be delay in reaching milestones then there is uh, if, even if they take the children to um, a doctor sometimes the diagnosis is delayed a lot of uh, instances they are sometimes told uh, we can we can wait a little more and see so there will be delays in the diagnosis so uh, then uh, because they are not uh, reaching the milestones, there are difficulty maintaining their posture, difficulty feeding, difficulty swallowing. The child has a difficulty chewing, there will be drooling, so they have to cope with all this. And then communication problems, difficulty understanding, difficulty expressing, and the vision is affecting. So behavior, excessive crying, demanding behavior, not complying with therapy, difficulty ambulating, difficulty in ADLs, epilepsy, and so on. Parents have to. Uh, face all these problems and hope. So there's so many things. So when they go to school, this is what happens there. Just to tell you, this is true even in Sri Lanka. So uh, uh, I'll just quickly go through. I think you all are familiar with ICF model. 
so uh, uh, the contextual factors now that is getting even more complicated because uh, um, the not only the child's personality personal uh, things but the parents personal factors are also coming into contextual factors here i hope everybody is familiar with this uh, icf model this is the model that we use to approach any problems in uh, rehabilitation so how do we manage we need a multidisciplinary team because we were talking of so many problems that can be affected so we can't do it as one person so the child is in the center parents uh, doctors various uh, speech pathologists occupational therapists psychologists psychiatrists so many people have to be there just only a representation so uh, so how do we analyze the skill of a child um, to get a skill the muscle length the muscle tone strength and coordination has to be there to understand this we need to look at a child when he is born uh, when a child is born he just uh, you know if you uh, you know, keep the child uh, on the bed, it will just, uh, you know, lie there uh, without having uh, uh, any skills. So their uh, muscle length, the muscle tone, strength, coordination, everything has to be developed. Uh, and then uh, Communicate uh, to do that communication, perception, and sensation has to uh, come into play. Uh, so, if the child has no vision, the perception is affected, and sensation is affected, and the stimulation in the environment, everything should be there. Uh, and the concentration and attention has to play a role, and child has to have a stable posture and balance. So uh, a child does this during the first year of life. When a child is born, he has no skills. Uh, the first skill that he develops is smiling, which happens around the uh, you know uh, second month of life. First, and he starts recognizing the mother and um, he can start to follow an object with his eyes first and then uh, follows with the neck. Uh, neck also can be moved from side to side. So with that, he develops uh, the normally developing child, it gets to uh, some uh, head control and then learns to roll over and then try, uh, comes, uh, if he's seated, he can maintain a stable posture and then develops a balance uh, around, uh, you know, uh, six, seven months, he can sit with support. And then about nine months time, he develops the ability to learn from lying to sitting. With that, if a normal uh, child is normal, the length, tone, strength, and coordination can develop with communication, perception, sensation, and the concentration attention. Stable posture is a uh, must. So when I talked of uh, uh, expanded and revised DMFCS level at uh, be, be, before two years of age, that was what I was telling. They can have, they have to have at least sitting balance by the age of two years. So um, how do we plan therapy? We need an assessment. And uh, you need to assess the skills, muscle balance, motor control, stability of joints. Um, and then you identify the problems. And then you have to discuss with parents. And then you have to set a short term goal. So these goals are said to be smart. These should be specific, measurable, achievable, repeatable, and trackable. Uh, if I don't go into details, uh, if uh, the time won't permit me, the goals are said to be smart. We have to try, and this is what I'm trying to do in my clinic during MDCs. Uh, we are trying to set smart goals and go forward from assessment. Uh, so after discussing with the parents, we set a short-term goal and we have a treatment plan to achieve that. And then <clears throat> we reassess. Uh, we implement the treatment plan and then we reassess, uh, monitor therapy. And um, we see whether the short-term goals have been achieved. 
and the milestone has been achieved, GMFC is level, uh, whether he's maintaining or uh, achieving, uh, coming to an upper level and the final outcome. Sometimes uh, you're trying to move forward like that, but uh, there's a time that developmental delay or arrest can happen depending on the severity of the brain damage. And we then can modify the goals uh, and go the same cycle again. So this is a very uh, useful plan. This is again by my uh, beloved mentor, Dr. Mihavan. Look, it's a very beautiful slide. So principles of therapy, we have to try to elongate the relevant muscles and the activation. And elongation plus activation should bring about functional abilities. Smiling around two months, foot-to-foot -foot play around four months of time, hand-to-foot play about six months time. And then around this time, the child stabilizes himself against gravity. So that's a, a must with our early intervention that should be achieved with our early interventions. So therapy guidelines should be family-centered, should facilitate movements, should be meaningful and play-centered, and integrated into daily activities. Handling, positioning, feeding, dressing, and playing should be integrated into daily activities of the family. Otherwise, it will be a very big burden with the active participation of the child. The child should be happy doing this which positively influence the brain development of skills. So how the therapy should be planned? Again, the same uh, thing we need to emphasize. Passive movements are not of no benefit. This should be, uh, things should be task specific, but variable. Every day, if you ask the child to do the same thing, it won't, you know, the child won't enjoy and there won't be any benefit. Child is mentally and physically engaged in the activity. So it should be intensive and incrementally challenging should be play-based aerobic fitness also should be improved in all the children so external support memorizing and repeating activities are less effective any surgical intervention should be uh, done after a careful evaluation and discussion with experience with an experienced or orthopedic surgeon uh, i have to mention here when i work in lrh always I have a discussion orthopedic discussion with Dr. Sunil Vijayaratna where we make collective decisions do interventions help and how does it happen? So there's a, a phenomenon called neuroplasticity. Neonatal human brain contains trillions of neurons. They develop new skills by forming new synapses and pathways. Large number of nerve cells disappear by the end of two years. This rewiring and pruning helps the brain to develop, you know, adapt to new situations. Ongoing process, this is an ongoing process which persists throughout life, but it's maximal. Uh, during the first two years. Out of that also, first year is very important. The, but for certain skills, uh, even though it goes on uh, throughout life, but for certain skills, there's a wide window of opportunity at very young age. So this opportunity should be harnessed by early interventions. So this again shows how windows of plasticity operate in different uh, areas sensory, motor and language, and higher cognition. It even takes a very long time to mature. This higher cognition matures around 40 years of age. So this again shows uh, how sensitive the development, brain development. Many of these things happen very early in life, preschool years, e even during the first year of life, a lot of things have happened. So it's very important to uh, arrange early interventions. So early interventions help capture the maximum capacity of the brain to adapt using the windows of plasticity gives the best chance of developing skills for a child with cerebral palsy. Early diagnosis and referral to rehabilitation services is very important. How to diagnose early? General movements assessment is very useful. Uh, it's a very non-invasive thing. There are motor patterns such as startles and twitches, which I will show you a, a video. So there are two periods uh, of uh, uh, two windows that uh, you can uh, see. Uh, there are two types of movements, writhing movements and fidgety movements. So this is, this is uh, you do the general movements assessment for at-risk infants. So this, uh, this is a video to show, uh, but, uh, but give you an idea about general movements. So in 
a very young infant, you look at, look at this, uh, look at the movements, they move randomly. You may move all four limbs and the trunk. Uh, you may not have noticed this, but uh, this is happening in uh, all the infants. People have realized that there are patterns. So they have recognized normal patterns and abnormal patterns. This is how they look like. Um, and this, along with Hine, I was talking to you about uh, Hammersmith infant neurological examination. So this is a picture of Hammersmith. So the general movement assessments together with Hines give you a 98% predictability. So when you detect um, uh, early, so it gives the best chance for the child to uh, come out without much disability. So spasticity, uh, it's a motor disorder by a velocity dependent increase in chronic stretch reflex. So this is modified tardio scale where you do a rapid stretch and come to R1 and R2. If there is an R1 and R2 uh, difference, I suppose that you are familiar with these things. You call it a dynamic tone, R2 uh, and R1 difference. There's a dynamic tone. So dynamic contracture, you can use baclofen, OTPT, Botox um, to manage and, and A force. Uh, if it is, uh, you know, there's gone beyond that, uh, there's uh, the normal range of that, uh, you know, muscle cannot be achieved, you call it a fixed contracture. And uh, if you have a dynamic and uh, fixed contracture together, you call it a mixed contracture. When the contractures becomes fixed, you need orthopedic surgery. So, and there is dystonia, atetosis, uh, which you know you have to use positioning when the uh, drugs like benzexols, cement, clonidine, a lot of things you have to use. And then we come to gait analysis. This is not a forum to explain you the full range of gait analysis. I'm just introducing you. There are components of, of gait analysis, observational and instrumental. If you have a gait lab, there will be gait videos and clinical examination kinematics and kinetics. So this is your gait cycle uh, divided into many uh, stages. And these are the classifications, spastic hemiplegics, spastic diaplegia, so many types of classification. And if I, you know, take you through a simple gait video, this is, you know, if you look carefully, this child is, you know, failing to clear the uh, floor with his right foot. If you classify that, um, this is not the forum to take you through all the classifications, but you should be able to appreciate. This is called drop foot. This is the first type in spastic uh, uh, hemiplegia. So here's another video. This child is crouching. So this is an example. These are simple observational gait analysis, which is possible in Sri Lanka. There are tools to slow down the, uh, you know, slow down their gait. This child is crouching. And uh, this is, uh, this child is uh, that those above two are in the sagittal plane. So this child is having a problem in coronal plane as well. So this, uh, this type of, uh, coronal plane problems must be addressed with surgery. So these are kinematic changes. So we make decisions after this analysis to give Botox, cast, A force, and surgery, and so on, with objective assessment, and record observations, and you can do a lot of things with after gate analysis. So there are so many types of A force, which I am not, uh, this uh, is, too much to talk on that. And then hip pathology, we need to monitor their hips, which hip pathology will depend on the GMFCS level, age, and gait classification. My, uh, so you measure the migration percentage. So there's Australian Hip Surveillance Guideline, which we follow, which uh, revised in grade 2020. So this is uh, a chart to show how often you have to do it. So this is the picture to show you how you calculate migration percentage. It's the percentage of the uh, 
femoral head lying outside vestibular um, roof. This is a hip screen, a tool that we use to do it uh, without much difficulty in our clinic setting. You have in this tool, you can do it like this and it is calibered. You take the uh, femoral head under this uh, picture, divide it into 10 with the app and you can easily calculate that. So there are assisted devices that we use, standing frames, special seats, posterior walkers, crutches. So this is a standing frame where the child is able to stand and uh, work. Uh, so she's trying to do difficult maneuvers. The standing stability helps her to do the activity, which can improve her hand functions and things later. Special seats, they help to maintain spinal alignment, uh, postpone sit dislocation, and uh, feeding and activities could be easier. So this is um, what interventions uh, are helpful and what are not. The world always has this debate. This is the famous article of Noah Qatar, The Traffic Lights. It is uh, first, it first came in 2014 and then uh, again, uh, it was revised in February 2020. This is the latest article. It tells you what are the good interventions and what are bad. So it's again uh, one lecture per se. So these are some list, uh, list of green interventions to highlight a few. Uh, constraint induced movement therapy. Uh, when you are a hemiplegic child, you can constrain the good hand and do it. And bimanual activities, they are very good therapies. So we have to know what are the green interventions and then try to practice those things. And yellow interventions, probably uh, do it. And there are, if you go back, so these are green interventions, yellow and red, like traffic lights. Your red interventions are probably harmful. Your green interventions have definitely provided uh, uh, information that they are beneficial. The size of the uh, circle tells you uh, the strength of evidence, like uh, uh, randomized control trials and so on. So there's a thing called worth it line. You know, you move above the worth it line, there's more evidence that the uh, intervention is helpful. So we need to pick and choose the interventions that we do. So, yeah. So I would like to, I'm coming to the end of uh, my talks. I would like to uh, show, share my sentiments with this uh, little video. This is a child we saw about three months back. She could not, uh, you know, uh, she was using a posterior walk at that time. Uh, with the A4 seat, she couldn't do that. It was very difficult with the A4 on. That's why the, the video without the a force. This is this child now, after interventions, about three months later. So this is a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, rewarding thing to manage these children because if you don't address the problem properly, they don't uh, uh, improve. So the key points, again, I'm uh, borrowing this slide from my beloved teacher. So early referrals are desirable at it, as it gives the infant best chance to improve his skills. Milestones can still be achieved without interventions to a certain level. So anyway, the child will achieve milestones without our interventions, but we have to optimize and we can definitely take them to a greater heights if we understand and manage. The goal in the first year is to promote stability against gravity, which is why I was emphasizing on expanded and revised uh, GMFCS uh, chart. So stability, particularly at shoulder girdle, provides foundation for movement pattern, development, mobility with control. So without getting the uh, you know, upper body, you never will be able to get the lower body and to walk. So you need to realize that for the neck, the shoulders, and the trunk balance, and then the standing balance and walking. So even if you hold the child by hand and walk for 100 years, it won't happen uh, unless you go for the achieve the balance. So activating serratus anterior, abdominal oblique, gluteus maximus should be focused early in therapy as these muscles provide stability in upright position. So still body is essential to develop attention and communication skills also. 
I again uh, give this tribute to Dr. Nihagun Tilaka. I don't, did not, could not change this slide because it's uh, many important key points there. So there are my acknowledgements. Uh, Dr. Nihagun Tilaka, from whom I learned most of my uh, knowledge, I gathered uh, from him and Gamono. Uh, who gave me a lot of knowledge about um, uh, early detection by uh, uh, this uh, gross, uh, movement, early movement patterns, uh, and the children and parents in these videos. These are my references, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jadri, for that very excellent talk. I know it's a very vast topic, but you made it uh, very comprehensive uh, in a very short period. I uh, was wondering if there are any questions from the audience. You can type in the questions in the chat box if you wish to. Yeah, I can see one question. It goes as, ma'am, can you please mention where special schools for these children are available in Sri Lanka? Um, uh, it's, uh, it's like this. Uh, there are, they are scattered all around the country. There are uh, certain centers which are run by NGOs. And even uh, when you talk of special schools, Saraj, you might understand the uh, now the disabled children should be you know equally uh, you know uh, they, they have to be given the same uh, uh, they have to be included in the mainstream schools so wherever you can yeah, you have to admit them to normal schools and uh, if they are too disabled there are centers uh, that are scattered around the country uh, but the, the way you can do it is to uh, get it to the social service officers in the area they know where these schools are scattered because uh, in Colombo there are a few um, uh, I cannot specify uh, because there are many I hope you I answered your question yeah, I, you yeah yeah uh, and uh, there's one more question that uh, person is asking about uh, any are there any specific special assessment tools specific yeah, to yeah. Sri Lanka uh, assessment tools specific to Sri Lanka assessment tools uh, you know I don't think any of us have developed specific tools for assessment, especially for Sri Lanka. But I know that there are there is an app developed by uh, you know Saman Mali and the team for that is an app uh, to make speech uh, you know speech disabilities. Uh, Sri Lanka has developed an app for them to you know um, for their easy communication assessment tools. I'm not aware of. I, I think probably not, right? So we are probably yeah. uh, extrapolating their knowledge as well as we may be culturally, we may be using culturally acceptable things in our setup. Okay, uh, and uh, regarding yeah. the special schools, I think uh, it's always either for the one who asked the question, I think it's yeah. always better to go through their clinician, whoever yeah. the patient is being looked after so that they could guide them through to the social services and the necessary Right. And it's better yeah. to uh, do a cognitive assessment and uh, determine that as well, uh, isn't it, Saraji? Yeah, so, yeah that's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah, that's yeah. that's yeah. very useful because then they know where they are placed and all that. Yeah. So yeah. that I think the person who's looking after that child or the pediatrician or the mm -hmm. whoever the clinician who's doing that could uh, easily refer them to the necessary places. I suppose it's been happening uh, in our clinic. So maybe uh, that person could actually go through that. Uh, I know that the school's uh, system is not really developed in Sri Lanka yeah. as in other countries, yeah. but still we do have some centers as uh, Jatri mentioned. Um, yeah, any further questions? Yeah, I think it was a very comprehensive talk. I don't think anybody would have any questions really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, know, I, I had a hard time because uh, there are so many specific things uh, which I cannot explain. It's a quick run through. I don't know whether it was confusing. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, yeah, but I suppose it's, I think it's okay, Joanna. And anyway, uh, the early intervention you highlighted on the early intervention, I think that's what we should highlight on because that gives us a lot of, uh, you know, uh, outcomes are really better if we uh, intervene early. So I think that's the main key here to refer them early, detect them yeah. early. The main thing. Uh, Saraji, I know the time has run out. So there's a question, madam, how often we should monitor cerebral palsy in the clinic setup? Uh, there's a question like that so uh, that is uh, it, it's individual sometimes an infants i sometimes get them down every two weeks under one years that that's the uh, period you have to give maximum attention and some uh, older kids i don't see for three four months so it, it always depends on what you want to do and the, depending on the child's disability okay thank you yeah, uh, yeah i agree with that yes Okay, then uh, I think uh, on behalf of the SLMA uh, subcommittee, uh, expert subcommittee in rehabilitation, I would like to thank Dr. Jatrida Jagoda for giving that excellent lecture. Thank you very much, Jatri. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and I think all of us uh, could, uh, if there are any questions, maybe we could uh, post to Jatri later on if you need to ask any questions. Right. Thank you very much.